and we are recording. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today at the Syllabus Lab 3. Um, uh, I'm uh, Linda Howell, and I will be uh, leading us in a conversation. And I do want to underscore that this is a conversation about plagiarism. Um, plagiarism tends to be one of those really hot topic, um, hot button topics, uh, triggers a lot of um, affect and emotion. And um, I know that faculty and students, they all have their different perspectives on it. So today's presentation is really a way of walking through some of that conversation to spur, spur some uh, discussion um, and to hopefully set the foundation for further discussions. Um, and I'm so glad to see Stephanie here because, you know, uh, the library is a really important component of this type of conversation. So uh, thank you all. Uh, before we get started, though, I would like, uh, since this is a, a small session, I'd like to maybe go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves. Um, and I'll start. Uh, I am uh, Linda Howell. I'm an assistant director in the Department of English. I also am the director of the Writing Programming Center. And um, director of the QEP, the Quality Enhancement Plan, um, which will be important to think about, especially in terms of this topic as we go through. Um, I'll hand it over to Gordon and Ash, and then we'll go to the to the boxes on the screen. <laughs> I'm Gordon Rikita. I'm a professor in anthropology in the uh, sociology, anthropology, and social work department. Awesome. Ash? I'm Ash Faulkner. I work in the writing program, and I've had a chance to help out a bit with developing the QEP including the academic integrity components. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll go by the boxes that we see on the screen. So Lev, would you uh, start us off? Sure, Lev Gaspar, Associate Dean for Faculty Advancement, uh, also Professor of Physics. Thank you. And then Stephanie? Hey all, I'm Stephanie Race. I'm the Head of Research and Outreach at the Library Liaison for the STEM programs and super curious about this session. <laughs> Well, I hope it's good for you, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, next up, Casey. Hi, I'm Casey Collin. I am an assistant professor in nutrition and dietetics. Awesome. Thanks, Casey. Um, and then uh, Jenna. Hi, I'm Jenna Bradley, and I'm an instructor um, in mathematics. Awesome. And then uh, Lisa, you'll kind of round us out. Oh. Her, her AV isn't set up, so she teaches neuroscience and psych. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. Appreciate it. Um, so, um, well, first of all, I kind of want to give a background here as to, um, yeah, it's not working. Sorry. <laughs> Technical issues. Is it because it's on the Zoom? Could be. Yeah. We don't always advance with the mouse if you have to. Yeah. Dang. Forgive us. There we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so the first thing I'd like to do is kind of establish um, my own interest in this conversation. And uh, it's, it's multiple parts. Uh, one is, uh, of course, as I said before, the QEP writing around the curriculum. Uh, I direct and part of that uh, QEP, as you'll see, and I put the language from the executive summary here, uh, is that we're concerned with addressing faculty and student concerns about evidence, citation, sentence level issues, writing purpose, and intended audience. And you'll see that the first two are evidence and citation, which are very mu much connected to this conversation about plagiarism. Uh, the second thing is as the director of the writing program and the center, uh, of course, that is a nexus uh, unit for the conversation about plagiarism. So um, I am often involved in either conversations with faculty about student plagiarism or on the periphery of those kind of appeal cases that end up coming up. Uh, third, uh, my dissertation title is called The Plagiarism Turn, uh, <laughs> Digital Savagery and Textual Tr Tricksterism. So you can tell that there, there's a theme here. Um, and I have, if you were to, to put my uh, relationship with uh, plagiarism in a Facebook status, it would be, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then finally, my current research um, that I'm working on is on QAnon uh, and fan studies. 
And one of the thing, areas that I'm working on is the issues of authorship, authority, and authenticity, uh, which again, thematically tied to kind of this conversation about plagiarism. And the reason I wanted to foreground this, not only to kind of um, give you a sense of my experience of it, but also to give us a sense of the complexity. When we say the word plagiarism, often it's a placeholder for a lot of different issues, right? And so, and oftentimes those issues, while very recognizable to us as professionals in our field, because we have been inculcated into our culture, right? We have spent years and years working on things like citation and sourcing. I mean, it's, it's the bread and butter of our field. Students might not have that same perspective, right? They're not part of the same culture. And oftentimes, this is where a lot of the affect and the emotionally charged issues around plagiarism often, plagiarism often occur. It's basically of two cultures that are starting to collide. And this is one of those uh, nodes in around which and in which they collide. So given that, kind of to give my own background, um, I have this slide and it's a lot of text and I apologize because you know rule number one of PowerPoint is you don't put a lot of text on there. So I just broke the rule. Uh, but I think it's important because this is, um, plagiarism is very much a conversation in writing studies, which is a, which is a discipline I'm, I'm a part of. And um, there's actually an intellectual property caucus at the National Council for Teachers of English, the NCTE. The college version of the conference is called the Four Cs. Um, which is the uh, Conference on Com College Communication and Composition. And so this quote actually comes from uh, one of their documents, one of their statements on called A Student's Rights to Their Writing and to the Writing of Others. And you can read most of it. I mean, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I do want to underscore uh, the last couple of sentences. And that is, and the effects of this panopticon-like fishbowl that PDSs, by the way, PDSs here are protection to now, plagiarism detection software providers, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and in some cases, faculty have created, have, um, created exasper exacerbated the, the problem. Thus the war irony noted on plagiarism is futile. We may have less plagiarism, but the students still lack an understanding of why plagiarism is wrong. Punishing those who plagiarize might stop some, but it might also encourage, encourage others to try harder to avoid plagiarism. And to, to avoid um, not plagiarism, but detection. <laughs> and the reason I say this is because this is really where a lot of our, a lot of our angst comes from, right? How do we prevent it? Um, how do we detect it? Um, and a lot of times we rely on these detective, detection softwares, which are pose their own problems with intellectual property. And so you can start to see the way that we have tried to address the problem often creates other problems, right? So you start to see like this, you know, um, exacerbating, to use their word, uh, situation, which kind of gets me to the point of this, this uh, presentation. And by the way, let me say at any point, please stop. Um, uh, please stop me. And, you know, if you have conversation, uh, observations or anything you'd like to share, please feel free to. But this slide is really the problems of plagiarism. So in a nutshell, I think one of the biggest issues is the cultural versus the technical practice, right? Um, so what do I mean by that? What I mean is that there's a lot of cultural cachet that comes with the word plagiarism, right? So I'm just going to throw it out there. So when I say the word plagiarism, what do you usually think of? What's kind of the first thing that comes to your mind? Anybody? Well, for me, it's um, I immediately think of students cutting and pasting. Okay. Typically from the web into uh, an assignment. Okay, so you think of it as kind of this uh, uh, efficiency approach, you know, they're just trying to, you know, cut and paste. Well, typically, typically it's they're, they're trying to get something on the page at the last minute, you know, before they sign it's due. Okay, right. yes, there's the, the time management issue. <laughs> what are some other observations? What, when you say, when I say the word plagiarism, what comes to mind? I think, I think cheating, not in the real sense of cheating but cheating right okay so cheating is often a that's a, that's a really good one 
Um, I also will say, I think unintentional and intentional. Right. So, yeah, so, I mean, so that gets to one of the, the bullet points here, right? So the, when I talk about cultural versus technical, part of this is also understanding habit formation, right? So if you have, especially in the last like generation or two of students, and even before that, especially as electronic sourcing became much more a part of how we access materials, right? There is the personal, the digital experience, right? Versus what we expect as an academic or professional experience and practice, right? So you have this disconnect. I often say, I often use this example. It's like, and we do this all the time. If you're looking at a document, if you're reading something online, right? And you click on a hyperlink, that hyperlink takes you to another source, right? Now, the validity of that source is another question, but the, 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 the process there is that your citation is already kind of embedded in your reading of it. Right? So you're just clicking on the link and going to something else. It's almost hidden in a way. And if, if you're, you know, and if you're thinking about that as somebody who is, if, if you grow up developmentally and that's how you expect text to operate, right, then citation has to become something that is much more explicit a part of your understanding of writing, right? Because what your experience is, is it's very much a, yeah, I just click on that and that takes me somewhere else, right? That is a citation mechanism, even if it's not, you know, how we traditionally think of citation. One proof that students don't know that citation is that they don't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So they don't know how to hit command K on their Mac or, you know, click hyperlink on their PC and embed a link to a source wow. right. as the Wall Street Journal or any trade publication or the New York Times would. Yes, right. So there's an operational issue here, right? That's that's both, but it's, it links to a cultural kind of preconceit about how, how text operate. The other thing is, so what ends up happening is we have a form of code switching, right? So you kind of, we're asking students to, to move through different types of, of writing and reading processes. And again, most of this is not explicit, right? Because again, going back to most of the time, we, we're at the back end of the inculcation, or the back end of that acculturation, not the front end, right? Um, and I know that Stephanie, I'm looking at your box right now and you, I mean, I'm sure that you experience that again and again as a librarian with working with students, um, trying to get them to internalize those values, right? So, <laughs> um, and you know, we, we all, as faculty, we're, you know, we're all faculty here. That's kind of like, that's one of our frustrations. Um, the other thing is, and going back to your point, like a value added versus an efficiency approach. So let's just be honest. And I'm gonna put myself in here when I was an undergrad, like I procrastinated. Right. I, I I waited until the end a lot to, to write my papers. I mean, I might have now again, I was thinking about the paper. Right. But it, I usually was writing it several days, if not the night before I submitted it and uh, not leaving myself time to think, do things like proofread. By the way, citation and that is part of a proofreading process as well. Right. Because there's kind of a format issue. But I didn't I, because I didn't value it. It wasn't something that I was taught, not so much that I was taught to value, but I just didn't, it wasn't in my wheelhouse then, right? Now it is, of course, but then it was, I was still a, a novice. And then finally, format, a formal and format. I kind of use these together as kind of a play on language. Um, because again, a lot of times when we, plagiarism is a placeholder, but it's also a formal placeholder, right? Uh, students get caught in the weeds of, oh, I don't know how to cite this. It's like, uh, I will tell you, I'm an expert on plagiarism. I do not know all of MLA, nor would I ever want to, uh, because I don't want to punish myself, first of all. And second of all, I have a life. <laughs> um, but here's the thing, right? I know how to go and look for it. I know what I'm looking for, right? So, so I know the MLA is a, a resource that I can, I, I avail myself of to check you know, my citations, but it's also a style you know, as opposed to APA. So they have their own rules and regulations. And so the idea here is to start to think about the grammar of citation and the styles of citation. And they're very different, right? 
Um, I often think of plagiarism and grammar in the same way. We tend to talk about it in, in, our, in, in our culture, especially academic culture, is again, they represent these larger questions that we, we need help articulating. So a lot of time it's not a grammar problem, it's a stylistic issue, right? That leads to a grammar problem. So a lot of times it's a, it might be a plagiarism issue, but plagiarism is representative of an issue with sources or not understanding how to read sources, how to use sources, how to approach them. Um, so it's more representative of, of a larger problem than just the fact that they didn't cite, right? And so, um, so that's kind of the some of the problems of plagiarism. Um, I also put down on here the other things to consider. One is, and this is professional, right? So I'm in the humanities. Humanities, the, one of the biggest things is single authorship, right? I mean, we're still kind of you know dealing with the author's genius, um, you know, back from the, the romantics. Um, but that's very different in other uh, other disciplines, which collaborative authorship is, you know, is is the convention. You don't have a lot of single authorship in some fields. And in fact, if there was single authorship, they might be looked at as a scans, right? It might be looked at as like, well, you know, I'm not saying that it wasn't right, but it's just like, okay, you know, what is this doing, right? Um, there's also the issues of authenticity and authority. I like to play with uh, homonyms, by the way. So that's why I was like authorship authority. <laughs> um, but the, this all touches plagiarism, right? Because if the, you know, the, the, one of the things with issue, issues with plagiarism is the issue of authenticity and originality, right? Uh, did, you, you know, did you actually put the thinking work in here? Um, another thing is invention, in intention, right? So Stephanie, I'm gonna call, come call back to your earlier com comment, right? A lot of times you struggle with plagiarism is the intention, the, the intentional fallacy, I like to think of it as, um, and that is, can we really ascribe attention, intention, right? Um, now, by the way, this is not an apology for plagiarism, right? There are people who do contract cheating. There are, I mean, there's, there's all these different ways of, being malicious when it comes to plagiarism. But there are also times when it's really a misunderstanding of process, right? And how do we determine that intention, right? How, I mean, how do, we, how, how do we look at it? How do we, uh, from the product, how do we actually understand the process, right? Um, the other thing is the thing about common knowledge versus the commons of knowledge. And this goes back to another digital issue is that we often talk about like, you don't have to cite that because it's common knowledge. Students really struggle over that. Like what does common knowledge mean, All right? But simultaneously what we have are commons of knowledge and knowledge is. Um, and understanding that a lot, part of scholarship is actually contributing to that commons, contributing to that, you know, th th that wealth of, uh, of information. And so, I want to kind of end this with something to really point back though. All of this is to say, part of the conversation we need to have with ourselves and with our students is the language that we use when we talk about plagiarism. So for those who are interested, the etymology of the word plagiarism uh, is actually the word kidnap, right? So plagiarism comes from the word kidnap. Uh, so it's just so you know that, yeah, yes. Um, the root, uh, it's um, Indo-European, yeah, because I'm that nerd. <laughs> uh, yes, and I wrote a dissertation on it. Um, but, but so kidnapping, right? And a lot of times when we talk about plagiarism, we tend to talk about it in those terms, as a crime, as an offense, as a violation. You know, we often talk about things like integrity, dishonesty. All right, and so the way that we frame that conversation can often frame the way that we react to it when it happens, but also frame the way the students understand it. Um, so it, uh, language does to a certain extent frame the reality with which we're approaching <laughs> um, this topic. Before I move on to the next slide though, um, are there any comments so far from your experience of plagiarism? Have you had anybody who has plagiarized yet, Lev? 
I think just one small comment. I mean, that's in relation to the plagiarism uh, of that students do sometimes. Uh, sometimes students just don't realize how bad it is, how, how we perceive it as a crime. I mean, some of us perceive it as a crime. And that's, that's something that needs to be instilled in students, I think. Because I remember teaching a lab and getting lab report that was pretty much cut, cut and pasted from the lab manual. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I told you not to do it. Why did you do this? <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know and, and the it, usual response, but I mean, it's it's like, well, why did you steal this thing? <laughs> you well, know, yeah. the stealing is crime, right? <laughs> so, but maybe maybe some students don't. But there is another part of it, which is, you know, at what point do we say, well, students didn't know? Is yeah. it when a student is a graduate mm -hmm. or a senior, junior, sophomore? Well, and I think that, no, that's a great question. And that's kind of one of the questions of the QEP to a certain extent. And that is, you know, we we have these policies, right? We have these procedures and we have these academic misconduct, but are we really clear? And do we signal it from the get-go, right? Especially to the, so I think of, uh, so I think of the university as a community, right? And like every year, every semester, we have new members of the community coming in, mm -hmm. but they don't understand what the conventions are. Right? They don't understand like what our rules of proce or procedures are. I mean, they're they're new. I mean, I, and I hate to frame it this way, but to a certain extent, they're they're immigrants to the space, yeah. right? And we're kind of like, okay, but you should already know how to do this. And and one of the things I always get frustrated with the conversation about plagiarism is we tend to naturalize it. It's like we don't we don't we're not born citing people, right? I mean, I don't pop out of the womb and all of a sudden I'm you know I mean it's like I don't have that notion of the world um not saying that it's again this is not an apology for plagiarism it is it's actually a defense of it you know it's saying not a defense of citation i i don't think it was apology for plagiarism i think it was a defense of citation because citation is a valuable and i actually think it's more important now than ever because of mis misinformation mm -hmm. and clearly the cultural kind of issues of dealing with sources and how to cite and how to look at sources that are legitimate and expert. So, I mean, I think of this as a larger cultural problem and that we're on the front lines of it, right? And so, so you're absolutely right, Lev. It's like, we can't wait until somebody's graduating to all of a sudden say, hey, did you not learn one of the fundamental, you know, precepts of being within this community? And that is you cite your sources, right? Because I have to be able to go back and look to see if the sources that you use are legitimate and actually hold up to the to the argument, right? I have to be able to go and look at the data because your argument or your your observations hinge on this conversation that you need to honor, right? I mean, then part of it, it's like you need to honor the work that's been done before you. Um, and so I think that that's, I'm sorry, I get passionate about it because it's like, uh, I don't think that institutions um, do a really good job of articulating that. We articulate the emotion, but we don't articulate the fact that we're passionate about this because we've dedicated our lives to research, right? To honoring kind of the genealogy of sources and experts that have come before us and that we've wanted to participate in. If I put the word honor on a website that no one sees, is that enough? Yes. No. <laughs> 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 but we also, I mean, I think to, to sort of to, uh, to, to echo your point, we are invested in this process, right? Mm -hmm. We do it ourselves mm -hmm. and we are creators of knowledge. And then when we see, if, if I see someone stealing Ash's work, it, it touches me because I think, well, if they're stealing his work, they'll just soon steal mine or someone's stealing mine. And so it really does become, you know, it, it, it really inflames our emotions. I think as exactly. academics, exactly. it's, and, 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 it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a high crime or misdemeanor in terms of academia. And I think that this way also we're responsible parties for our disciplines, right. right? So I have this, I have this anecdote and it's gonna sound really weird, so I apologize, but I think of it this way. I think, so like many, many years ago, back in the dark ages, right? Um, I was an office manager 
And um, this is right when P cards became a thing, right? And I used to get really pissed at faculty <laughs> for not having the receipts, right? Um, and of course I had that moment where I was sitting there going, it's not my money, you know? <laughs> uh, but I realized that, you know, I was part of that responsible party, right? And so even though for, for the faculty, it might've felt like a technical issue, right? Oh, I just lost my receipt. I knew on the back end that this was an issue of auditors, right? And like issues of, you know, uh, the, the, not that it was fraudulent, but that was kind of the discourse that was, it was Im embedded in, right? So I think of plagiarism and citation the same way. It's like, I'm a responsible party for my discipline. You know, I'm somebody who understands that you, th you student might think of it as a technical issue. You didn't take the time to work on this component of it because there's, we haven't shared the value with you. But on the back end, I know that if this, this type of, of behavior can lead to bad data, right? It can lead to bad, you know, arguments. Can, it can be life and death depending on the discipline and the types of work that we're doing, right? So even though it seems technical here, it represents ramifications that as an expert, I know now I have to, under, now I have to articulate to you, right? And how do I do that on an institutional level? How do I do that on a, on a, you know, classroom level, uh, how does, how do I do that? And, you know, and, and make it so that it, it doesn't seem like it's this big bad ghost that, but that it, it legitimately is a, um, is an obligation when you enter into this space, right? That you will, you will value evidence, that you will investigate evidence and you will cite it. And, and that's kind of the, um, the approach. So one of the things, so this next slide is how do we talk about plagiarism, right? So the whole point of this is we need to talk about plagiarism, right? Um, so the citation project, um, and I put the link in here. So if, you, or if you're interested, you can go and look at it. Um, Rebecca Moore Howard, who is kind of the, um, she's kind of the founder of plagiarism studies, right? She was really one of the first scholars to delve into it but beyond, um, kind of surface stuff that you saw in, in earlier um, iterations of the conversation. And she's been working with Sandra Jamison. They're both PIs on this project. And they've been basically gathering student um, papers from various institutions across the United States. And they've been coding it for many years and they've been writing about it. Uh, Sandra Jamison actually has this great article uh, or a great chapter in um, student plagiarism higher ed. And I put the quote in here and she basically calls on us as professionals that we need to develop um, pedagogical strategies that will help writers acquire the language and intertextuality practices. So not source practices, she's talking about intertextuality here, necessary for successful source-based writing. So it's kind of a call to action. And so in the field, this is how we often talk about it. When we're, we're talking about plagiarism, like if you're talking to people who work in plagiarism studies, right? It's very much about like, how do we do this responsibly? How do we do this through our pedagogy? How do we think about it institutionally? Um, and so I, I wanted to point that out and put our own language against it. And this is the UN, this is what's on the UNF academic. So if you go to UNF's website, right? You write in academic integrity into the search box. And this is the first link that will come up. This, this, is, on, this, is, a, this is the language on the first link. And I do wanna draw our attention to it. So this is what we operate under. Um, claiming, one's own, uh, claiming one's own work. Each student is honor bound to submit under his or her name or signature only his or her own work, to fully acknowledge his or her use of any information, ideas, or other matter belonging to someone else, and to properly document the source in question and to offer for credit only that work which he or she has completed in relation to the current course. Of course, I think that all those should be they, but you know, whatever. Um, violation of academic integrity, the universe, violations of academic integrity. So this is how it's worked out, right? So I wanna point out, this is my little arrow, honor bound and claiming, right? And then honor bound and violations, right? So this triangle of rhetoric is a little confusing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and it's like, uh, what, how does honor bound, what does honor bound mean here? 
right? So there's kind of an honor system, but not really an honor system. Uh, by the way, according to the International Center for Academic Integrity, uh, which is a pretty big uh, organization, the highest, they, like the highest level of academic integrity that institutions should move towards is an honor code, which is basically where students police themselves. And we don't have one. And we don't have one. <laughs> uh, Ash is very passionate about this, so. <laughs> um, but I wanted to kind of put, start to you know say, this is what we're operating under. This is the, the frame of our, now there's language other places, you know, but this is, this is like if I want to find academic integrity at UNF, this is the page that comes up as the first page, right? Um, and so I want us to be aware of that since we're this is the institution that we're working in. And so we kind of started doing this, but I kind of I wanted to do it um, really as an exercise. And after this part of the conversation, um, I'd like you to fill in the blank, right? Plagiarism is what? And so I'll give you like a minute. It's a, it's a quick. So I will start uh, since I said the film bike and I'll, uh, I'm actually, uh, so I'm going to cite myself here. So I'm, I'm, I'm adapting a quote from my own dissertation. Um, Plagiarism is erasing the name from the gravestone. So that's my contribution to this. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> oh yeah, writer. <laughs> Who wants to, so Stephanie, you said plagiarism is lazy. Okay. And then I said stealing someone else's work. Stealing someone else's work. I said not acknowledging your sources. Not acknowledging your sources. I said it's a disconnect between expectation and execution. Right. It could be malicious. It could be not. A thought crime. Oh, nice. <laughs> Jenna? I feel like it's a little different for me because in math, like, I don't really have students not citing work they're just like to me it's more cheating because they're just going to go online and like google the problem but there wasn't <laughs> really you know an original person to like steal from yeah no no this is interesting you know one of the you know one of the emergent issues in plagiarism right now plagiarism conversations is code coding coding mm, yeah right um so there is i mean so it starts popping up in all these different types of conversations but but yeah, yeah so there, 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 there is that sense of you know uh, but I, the thing I love about math is that there is this sense of, you know, you need to show your work, right? Yeah. So there is kind of a, there is an opportunity there that a lot of other disciplines don't have. And that is, you know, you're responsible for kind of walking me through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why I think it's really important if we value plagiarism, that we need to teach citation. And citation is process, not product, right? Um, and oftentimes we end up getting hung, hung up on the product. Um, so, so I wanted to do that kind of, kind of reorient us, uh, because this is my little, um, my little picture grid. <laughs> um, and so I, I often think of where plagiarism happens, right? Uh, I mean, in this, in particular, in this context, I, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, the plagiarism that happens when people, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, political a pol a politician stealing other politician speeches. And, um, there's a whole other conversation there. <laughs> uh, but I'm thinking about within the context of our institution. Um, it happens in the classroom most times, right? And the instructor is kind of the, the central figure of that space. Um, yes, yeah, students are involved in that space, but actually putting together the classroom, establishing the environment of the classroom, that's an instructor issue. 
so the instructor is part of the classroom. The classroom is part of the college and the department. The de college and department is part of the institution. This is all part of larger disciplinary conversations. And this is all part of a larger cultural conversation. And the closer you get to the, cl to the classroom, right, the more, the more you carry that, right? The more that seems like you carry those levels. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also further away from this that the, the student is, right? So they're kind of on that that large, you know, that uh, you know, outside that wall, that larger concentric circle, right? And they're kind of moving in, and they're, not, I mean, and like so, for example, how many students do you really think read their student conduct book about academic integrity? Well, I mean, you know, there are a couple of the nerds. <laughs> um, but for the most part, you know, it's because it's it's part of a whole package, right? I mean, this is not this is not punitive. I mean, it's not meant to to say you know students don't read. It's but basically, you know, I'm not going to read that when I have everything. Out. When things are much more important and pressing to me, like my schedule and my advising and my major. I mean, that's kind of a peripheral document. I'm only going to go to that if I'm accused of it. When it's too late, right? When it's too late. <laughs> Um, disciplinary, you know, they're not, so they're not going to understand that the American Historical Association has some very strong language about plagiarism. You should go read it. It's a very interesting read. <laughs> um, and uh, whereas, you know, other disciplines might not have as strong professional language as, as others. Um, so they're not going to understand that. They're definitely not going to understand the, you know, um, the college and department. Again, what they're going, how they're going to interact with that language is on the appellate mm -hmm. side, not on the actual side before they get into the class, right? And how do we make that accessible to them in the class as part of the class? That's the question I'm trying to pose here. Oh. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, and so that's why I did the, I'm working on this a little bit. I, I actually have another one, but this is the one I decided to use. <laughs> um, and so that kind of gets us to pedagogy and plagiarism. Um, so the Council of Writing Program Administrators, which is one of the professional organizations that um, writing pro WPAs are very much um, using all the time, they have a best practices statement. And the best practices statement involves, you need to, and this is like, this is not only for the classroom, this is for institutions, this is for that conversation happening around um, plagiarism. How do you prevent it? Right, because nobody, no, not one. Per Actually, I shouldn't say that. I should let me back up. Uh, for the most part, policing plagiarism is not enjoyable, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's not. So, I, I, I was not hired to be to you know to be a security guard for the intellectual property of the academy. <laughs> um, but part of this is like, how do I do this in my classroom, right? Because I don't want to have to deal with not only the appeals, I mean, that's more of a practical thing, but I want students failing. I, I want students to be successful. I want students to value what, value the things that they're here to learn, value citation, um, you know, not plagiarize because they know it's, it's not a good thing to plagiarize. I mean, not because they're fearful of getting caught for plagiarizing. Um, so the WPA basically suggests these as our best practices. Explain plagiarism and develop clear policies. This is something we can do as instructors, right? We can say, this is what plagiarism constitutes. And this is what's going to happen if you, you know, if you don't, uh, if you don't follow these tenets, right? And a lot of times what we do is we take language or we point them to the student conduct book. We say, okay, look at the student handbook, right? And it's like, well, if you value it, then you need to make time in the classroom. I think of it this way. If I'm going to grade it, I need to teach it. Right? That's my, my equivocation. It's like, if I'm going to grade, if I'm going to grade it and evaluate it and kind of use it, then I need to teach it. Um, the second thing is to improve the design and sequence of assignments. This goes back to something I said in the earlier slide, and that is, so let's just be honest, especially when it comes to plagiarism, Grading writing sucks, okay? <laughs> I mean, and I say this as somebody who has dedicated my life to writing instruction. <laughs> and um, so I totally get that, right? 
but part of this is that when we teach writing, we're not really teaching a product. We're teaching a process. We're teaching students how to move through it. And sometimes one student's process is very different than another student's process, both in research and writing and reading, right? And so in the writing classroom, it, it often becomes really, it becomes almost like a counseling session, right? Because you're, to me, you're working with students one-on-one -on -one to kind of help them maneuver through their own process. And that's a lot of work and a lot of labor. And if you have a class that has 100 students in it, then you don't want to assign a writing, class, a writing assignment and try to teach writing at the same time, right? Um, but I do think it's important to think about when you're thinking about writing assignments, if you're going to look for plagiarism, is there something you can do beforehand for them to just check themselves, right? So maybe have them do something like an annotated bibliography before they do a research paper, right? Because that's an apparatus through which they learn the citation practices, right? Um, and I know Stephanie, you guys have a lot of good material on on annotated bibs. Um, take you know, taking advantage of things like the library and all that. Having students do a, a full fledged lit review before they're into their the, into their research or as part of their research. So maybe you don't have them do a research paper as part of the class, but you have them do some components of it that you can give feedback on, right? Because it's still the process. Improve, uh, so attend to source and the use of reading. So one of the things that faculty often say when we've talked to them about plagiarism and about sources is they don't know how to read source material, right? I gave them this, I mean, it, it kind of, it connects to the meme, you know, read the syllabus, right? Um, but they don't read them because they don't know how to functionally read them a lot of times, right? So I hand them something from, you know, um, Jacques Derrida they don't know how to read Jacques Derrida. Um, so I have to tell them how to how to read Jacques Derrida. If I ever figured that out myself. Um, sorry, it was a bad example. Like, why would he come into my mind? Um, but we need to attend to sources and to the use of reading. So doing things like reading assignments, I know that sounds parochial, but it's not. Um, because academic reading is different than pleasure reading, than like daily reading. And may I interject yeah. here? This is a, an informal reflection of mine that's been haunting me more lately. And I, I spoke about it uh, today with some engineering students. I hypothesize, I believe, culturally it's okay to say I'm a bad writer or I'm not good at writing or I don't like writing. It's not culturally okay to say I'm a bad reader. Mm -hmm. I need help with reading. Right. But they do. Yes. Of course they do. Because again, this is not a kind of document to which we have been enculturated. We are not naturally, uh, you know, raised uh, to read these sorts of things, but it's still not okay. It seems to me, again, this, this is a working hypothesis. They can't say, I need help reading, but they do. And the writing problems that are surfacing are surfacing at the surface because of a deeper reading problem. And actually, I mean, if you don't mind, Jenna, I would, because you 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 are in math, right? I mean, do you find that problem with re with with math and reading that they don't know how to read? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. a prompt, an assignment. Uh, I don't really ever come across that type of problem. More just that they don't read. Like, if a question says do such and such, but they look at the problem and they think I'm asking them to solve it. Uh -huh. They'll just do it, like do the completely wrong problem because they didn't read the question. So I have a hard time getting them to like, not to actually read the question and not just like make assumptions about it. But I don't have any problems relating to like them not being able to read the questions just because most of the time they're really like short and there's not a lot of words and well no but I mean words. that's a great I mean and, and I think that this is actually what you're pointing to is is a misreading right so mm -hmm. they're jumping to they're, they're presuming so it, it is kind of a reading challenge right because yeah. maybe they're trained you know to go to that they're go they're trained to go to the product right 
and and they're not like trained and kind of to sit with the process. I know I keep saying that, and I, I mean, I know that's a dead horse I keep beating, but I really think it's important because I, I think that a lot, especially the testing culture, it moves students almost automatically to the solution, right? Like they're moved towards the product and the output and not so much the input, right? Not so much, okay, what do I need to do here? Everything's a test. Everything, yeah, everything's a test and, and that's why it's all high stakes. And all not very good. Yes. Lab, you, I mean, you're in the sciences. Do you find the same thing? I do occasionally, yeah, occasionally. So what, what, what was mentioned about uh, students misreading, misreading the problem, that happens quite a bit actually. So mm -hmm. they, students would assume something different and wouldn't ask you for clarification. Uh, on the test, uh, they would ask you many, many times about something that seems to be clearly written there. Uh, so it might be a problem, but I don't know whether this is sort of trying to read between the lines or not being able to read. So, <laughs> Well, I don't know, but I think that's a great question, right? I yeah. mean, because I think that, I mean, it's one of those things when we talk about um, in the writing classroom, it's like we always have, we're always having to recalibrate ourselves. Right, in terms of thinking about, okay, what do I presume you know already had and you already know how to do, right? Um, and it becomes really difficult for a, a, a student population coming from all different types of schools, right? Even though they share kind of the emphasis on testing, it's not the same kind of, they don't have the same kinds of experience, right? So I can't start somewhere. Um, I mean, even as something as simple as, expecting students to know how to go and get their books or how to how to write, read a syllabus yeah. i mean well i think of simplistic but yeah. but actually it's 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 i have it's to remind example. i have to remind myself that i mean that's a that's a conceit that i have and that a lot of you know i'm making my classroom more inaccessible that way mm -hmm. right so i have to think about those things i mean but that's really hard right because i'm constantly recalibrating yeah um so and, and of course, you know, the WPA ends with what is really important, um, I think that institutionally, is to take appropriate disciplinary actions, right? And I wanna point back to kind of UNS language and it's like, you know, policies predate procedures, right? So you have to have po clear policies in order to have clear procedures. And I think that this is where the WPA really was pointing towards. It's like, you have to have all these things happening in order to really have a, an effective disciplinary system. Like if you look at Syracuse, they have one of the better models, I think. They're very clear in their reparative versus their punitive approach, right? So it's not, you know, one and done. I mean, unless it's something like you've bought a paper or you've done something that's really, I mean, that you've, you know, bought a paper, I mean, a Greek house um, uh, plagiarism, which is kind of, you know, pretty widespread sometimes. Uh, but it's, it's really about trying to get students to, to learn rather than to be punished. Why this is important. Um, so the UNF data from the QEP survey, we did a survey of faculty and students. Um, and the so we basically, when we did the QEP for writing around the curriculum, we were looking at what should the emphasis be of writing, right? So we gave them 31 writing considerations. I mean, ranging from things like thesis statement to grammar, uh, to you know, uh, information fluency. I mean, a whole bunch of things. And the top concern for faculty uh, was the incorporation and analysis of sort uh, of information of evidence and sources. Right. So it was really about source integration. The second concern was avoiding plagiarism. <laughs> and it was like these two were the top of the you know and the, the third one which was a kind of a far behind was the grammar issue mm -hmm. um students on the other hand by the way the language was for was the same for both so we did not vary the language depending on audience mm -hmm. so we asked them to, to identify from the same list the top concern for students was cita understanding citation and style conventions right and uh, the second one was a thesis statement development. So basically what we've had in front of us, this data was like, okay, these two populations are having the same anxiety to a certain extent, but that's the same thing, but they're talking about it differently. They understand it differently. 
And that's really what the QEP has been based on is how to, how to basically pull those two languages together uh, so that there's not a gap, right? Um, and so we're, we, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, but I wanted to um, move away from plagiarism, right? To talking about something that we really can teach rather than prosecute. And that is citation, right? So I asked you the question, citation, uh, plagiarism is. Now I want you to do the same thing citation is. Fill in the blank citation is. Crediting the owner of the thought. Nice, Casey. Ever <laughs> tedious. <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> I'd make the case that it's connecting your reader to your sources. Uh -huh. And if you haven't done that, you haven't cited. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. Believe me, Steph. <laughs> uh, I'd say demonstrating to your readers that you've done the background research. Okay. Lab, did you have any? A quick one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there is another issue here, but it's, it's probably warrants another meeting. And that issue is of, you know, citations in a sense, citing somebody is a tool, particularly with uh, all the indexes that are generated for promotion and tenure and so on and so forth in, this, in different institutions. Yeah. If you uh, cite someone else's work, you are basically crediting somebody with uh, giving somebody credit which can be recognized by someone else in uh, her or his organization. And it also the, the, the side effect of that is that uh, typically the citations are uh, done for the journals that are sort of widely distributed. So if somebody doesn't have resources to publish in a journal that is widely distributed, then this person is not going to be cited. Yep. And therefore it's this person, even if brilliant, would not be able to rise to the level of those who are sort of enjoying the um, the situation when they have. Uh, but it, it is it is sort of different subject, and I, I don't think we need to discuss no, no, it right I think, now. No, I, no, but I think that that would be a great follow up conversation because mm -hmm. one of the things that we talked about, um, actually, I was talking to a few people about this. Um, this presentation is things like the H index, right? All these kind of indexes of, mm -hmm. because citation can be celebrity. Citation can be, you know, uh, credibility. Citation, yeah. it, I mean, so my, my fill in the blank is, and I was playing on my pun from the beginning, and that is citation is complicated, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a complicated system. And actually the, um, so when I, um, yeah, it's kind of, when I went to, um, yes. Um, so I wanted to end this with not so much we need to talk about plagiarism, but we need to talk about citation, right? Um, Robert Connors, who is, um, he, he was one of the uh, most, you know, um, well-respected kind of, um, not kind of, but scholars in writing studies. He wrote a two-part uh, essay in Rhetoric Review called The Rhetoric of Citation Systems, parts one and two. So I have to tell you, so like my dream class, by the way, is a, a class on bibliography. Um, because why wouldn't you want to spend all your time doing bibliographic stuff? It's so fascinating. I love the footnote. Um, by the way, if you're interested in citation, read Grafton's The Footnote. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. But Connors actually makes this great point about how citation systems are the foundation of Western intellectual activity, right? And he actually traces it from all the way, like, you know, from ancient gloss and, and eliminated manuscripts all the way to kind of 
what was his present day, which was at the end of the 20th century, which even from then, even from when he was writing has become even more complicated because of all these emergent technologies. Um, but I want us to keep that in mind uh, because there's another component here that we must always think about when we're talking about plagiarism and citation is that it's very much cultural, mm -hmm. right? So some of the, the best scholarship on plagiarism uh, especially in the last decade or so, has come from Australian scholar, Australian scholars, um, who are talking uh, because they encounter the Pacific and uh, a lot of a East Asian populations, who have very different concepts of what intellectual ownership looks like, and what the commons looks like, right? Um, and that's why I always want to kind of pay heed to the fact that our presumptions are very much Western presumptions, right? And that you know, um, especially as we try to um, engage in more global learning and more global learning practices and populations, um, you know, this is a value system, right? Um, and we have to be acknowledge, acknowledge kind of where those values come from. Um, so I want to end it with two slides. One is, so what, right? Mm -hmm. So we've done all this and, you know, the writing teacher in me is always like, well, so what? what's the point? <laughs> um, and so I have a few here. I think that, and I said this earlier, I think plagiarism, citation, all of this is kind of encapsulated in a larger conversation. And that is about how we deal with evidence, how we deal with source material. I think you can look culturally at what's happening right now with things like fake news and misinformation and see an emergent kind of, of really troubling um, culture of contention with expertise, uh, but also kind of a part of that is not learning, not knowing how to source cite things and not know how, how to find things, right? And for me, that's what citation is, it's the thoroughfare, it's the through line. I mean, I, I can find what, you, what you've found. I can look at what you've looked at. Um, Clear institutional policies. I mean, I think that's that's as urgent as anything else, especially for things like retention and metrics that we're very much concerned with. Um, Process-oriented instruction, discipline-specific practices, and um, instructive versus conduct systems, right? How do we build a re rehabilitative? Thanks, Lev, for coming, appreciate it. And then what now? Um, so, you're going to get an email at some point in the next probably month or so mm -hmm. for participation in the in, um, the International Center for Academic Integrity survey. Um, UNF is going to be participating in this uh, with a lot of other peer and non-peer institutions. We'll be marketing it in the fall and we'll be launching it in the spring. We'll be marketing in the fall, launching it in the spring. Uh, kind of Ash is our point person on this. So I'm going to uh, you know, urge everybody to fill that out um, because it will help us and really thinking about what our culture here is at UNF. Um, the second thing is um, I would encourage people to have substantive discussions in their departments about their policies, about how their policies align with their disciplines, you know, values, and how those are translated to the students, mm -hmm. right? I think that's really important. And it has to happen from faculty, with faculty, among faculty. Um, revisit and revise syllabus language. Right, I mean, that's uh, that's always a really good practice anyway for, for a lot of this stuff. Um, review writing assignments, right? So for example, I said before annotated bibliographies, mm -hmm. uh, we have a assignment, genealogy of sources, which is literally like family tree, give them a source mm -hmm. and they follow like the sources, you know, just like who's citing who. Um, another, th another assignment that I've done is I've actually given students um, a, a, a reading and had them annotate it and then turn it back in and then the next and then can it back out to other students and after five weeks basically they have an article that's been written on five times by five different students and i have them write a paper on the accounting for their reading from the first to the, to the last reading right um so things like that so that's that's process right they're learning how and finally i underscored this because i really think it's important ask students what they know and what they know how to do, right? Uh, because if we teach it, if, if we grade it, we must teach it. That's, that's my motto. Uh, and finally, this is just a self-plug. This is a, that, that final quote is from my dissertation. 
So I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> I had to do that. <laughs> um, but beyond that, that's kind of the the end of our um, the end of the presentation. Um, and I had to have, of course, I have a work cited. Although I have to say, I didn't cite my own dissertation. There you go. <laughs> I, I didn't do that. So, um, are there other questions or, you know, anything that was this helpful in thinking about it or thinking about some issues with plagiarism? I think it's very helpful, especially the reminder that we need to teach this, not just expect the students to come already prepared. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm very much a believer in that. It's like, you know, because um, so many times this I have run into students, it's like, you could tell they just don't know, you know, and it's like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, we gotta, we gotta walk you back. <laughs> Stephanie? No, I agree. And I think that, I think there is an assumption at some level that students do know and I think there's a, there are a lot of assumptions about what is taught early on uh -huh. and that students retain it. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and so I think it, it's, I just think it's important. I also was just taken with the fact that we had a physicist and a math professor here. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm like kind of excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's very exciting. That's why, because I do, I think that- I was you know, expecting a bunch of English people. <laughs> uh, no, the English people are, you know, over there going, you know, no, <laughs> don't want to hear it. <laughs> so, well, I appreciate y'all coming for this conversation, and and I really did mean when I told uh, Lev. I, I mean, I'll talk to Gordon, and maybe we can set up a a follow up to talk about citation rather than plagiarism, uh -huh. and we could talk about that. I mean, and it'd be great to. To maybe partner with you, Stephanie, and the library, because I know that there's, you know, there's kind of the technical issues of, you know, how to find how, you know, one is cited and indexing, but then we can marry that with the cultural. Yeah, when when Lev was making his comments, I was thinking about that because Stephanie, you're doing the the um, the bibliometrics right. series for us this this year, and um, looking at, you know, for for folks like physicists. Certain certain bibliometrics are great, right? right? But others are not, not so much. And and likewise for for folks in the humanities who are producing books, those H indexes are are, are almost worthless. Right. Um, and and so there's different kinds of citation of different kinds of um, resources going on. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to marry that with kind of that larger conversation about what it means to to cite and, you know, to be cited. Because mm -hmm. um, there's kind of an academic gaze, you know? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Sorry, that's a theorist. I mean, like, oh. <laughs> um, well, again, thank you, and Gordon. I, I want to hand it back over to you. Well, so. thank you, Linda. Um, really appreciate it. I think we have we have plans for a syllabus lab four mm -hmm. um, at the end, near the end of the term, I think in, yes. in late November, about um, revising your syllabi for the spring term. Right. You know, looking at what worked and what didn't work. And so um, keep an eye out for that and, and all the other OT events. It'd be fun. <laughs> well, thanks. thanks all for joining us. Have a good rest Thank of you. Time. Take care. Bye. Good job. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Oh. Oh. Oh.